proceed. I remind myself and you all of the importance of taqwa of Allah, that is reverential God consciousness. Allah Most High says, Qal Allah Ta'ala, Ya ayuha al-ladhina amnu attaqu Allah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Believers have taqwa of Allah with the taqwa due to Him and do not die except as Muslims. Wa qala ta'ala, يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم وما يتع الله رسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما الله says believers have taqwa of Allah and speak words which hit the mark he will put your actions right for you and forgive you your wrong deeds all who obey Allah and his messenger have won a mighty victory الحمد لله we find ourselves one week past the month of Ramadan into the month of Shawwal and the scholars they mention that a sign that one's Ramadan was successful and a sign that one's Ramadan was accepted is that that person post Ramadan is they increase in good deeds and they increase in goodness so if someone wants to know whether their Ramadan was fruitful is that they have to look at their post Ramadan life and that's why the scholars, there's a beautiful saying that they mention about the Eid, the celebratory prayers, or the, ce the day of Eid, the, ce the celebration. Is that Eid is not for the one who wears new and beautiful clothes and celebrates. Is that rather Eid, the celebration, is for the one whose obedience and good deeds increase. Right? And Eid is not for just riding nice vehicles and having nice clothes. Is that rather Eid is for the one, true Eid is when your sins are forgiven. And that's why they mentioned that Sayyidina Ali, one, one day he left on Eid, he went out of his house and his clothes were a bit shabby. They weren't. You know, we're supposed to wear, it's recommended on the celebratory day to wear beautiful clothes and to wear new clothes if we have new clothes. But this is the Emir Mu'minin, is that he left and he had shabby clothes. And they asked him, you know, on the day of Eid, this is the clothes that you're wearing. And he said that, And that every day that you don't disobey Allah in it, is that that's Eid. In other words, he wanted to teach them a lesson about the reality of these months and these seasons. And as we mentioned previously in our khutbah and in our speech, is that the month that we just came out of, the month of Ramadan, that the scholars, they call it a madrasa. They call it a school, a learning, a place of learning. And that what is the lesson of Ramadan? As we mentioned, the lesson of Ramadan is to acquire this attribute and this quality of taqwa, <laughs> which again is a very comprehensive word. But essentially, it means that performing all the obligations that Allah has placed upon you inwardly and outwardly, and abstaining from all the prohibitions that Allah has prohibited us from. Right? It's sometimes translated as God-fearingness or reverential consciousness of Allah. It's a very comprehensive word, taqwa. And of course, we know that that lesson that Allah says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ is that fasting has been prescribed upon you such that you may acquire or learn taqwa. Of course, that's not for a limited time. There's no such thing as taqwa for 30 days and then after Ramadan is that that doesn't apply anymore. Rather, the message or the idea or the, 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 the spirit of Ramadan is that we have these 30 days that we can recalibrate ourselves and that we could learn to pray more, we could learn to read Quran more, we could learn to give more charity, learn to do more good deeds, such that after we leave Ramadan is that those become, those become, a quali those become qualities for us and that we adorn ourselves with those attributes. And this concept of taqwa is that we're always reminded about taqwa. Always reminded about taqwa. Because why? Because having that reverential consciousness, that personal relationship, that God consciousness, is the center of this religion. It's the essence of this religion. And even if you look at it, this Jummah khutbah that we come and we congregate, congregate on the day of Friday and that there's a sermon, 
is that essentially the purpose of this sermon is to remind the believers about this important obligation of having taqwa, of being reverentially conscious of Allah, such that when we enter into this masjid and we enter into this khutbah, is that when we exit, we exit in a state that's better, we take something from it and we increase. And that this is really a beautiful aspect of this religion, is that it's not limited, for example, to once a week, or to once a year, or to some nominal practice. Rather, when we understand the fact that Allah is one, and His unity and His tawheed, is that that applies to every aspect of our lives. Is that that gives us a sense of holistic perspective. Because everything is related, and everything goes back to God, and everything is connected because God is one. So a believer's life is not separate, his religious life, so as to speak, is not separate, from his worldly life, so as to speak, and rather the remembrance of God should permeate every aspect of his life. And that you'll find this in the word deen, right? The word for religion in Arabic, generally it's deen. And it's a very rich word, a lot of these words are very rich, is that deen, the word deen comes from dain, which is a debt. So the idea is that we have a debt towards God, he has these obligations upon us, and we have to fulfill these obligations. Just like Yom al-Din, the day of Din is the day of resurrection, which is the day that all the debts fall due, right? Between you and God and between other people. So Din is not just religion, but it's more than that. It's also related to the word Medina, which is a city. In other words, organized society, because the place of a city is where debts occur and transactions, and that's why the scholars, they mention that ad-deen mu'amala is that true religion is not necessarily fasting or praying all the time, but it's in the treatment of others. Is that that's where the true religion lies, is having that taqwa with regards to others, is that it's mu'amala. And one of the tragic trends of modern Muslim world is that in our minds we kind of, come, we kind of separate the idea of our religious lives from our other religious lives, right? The compartmentalization of this religion where we just kind of, Ramadan is one thing and how we live our lives and come to the masjid is one thing and then how we live our lives outside the masjid is another thing. And that this is a huge error and it's a big mistake that, is, 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 that, that, that needs to be rectified. Is that, like I said, like I mentioned, that if someone understands the unity of Allah, if someone understands the oneness of Allah, is that that dhikr, that remembrance, will permeate everything in their lives. And that you'll find that with the Prophet ﷺ, is that how was he described? He was described as always remembering Allah, with whatever he was doing. So when he looked in the mirror, he had a supplication that, remembered, that, he, reminded, that he remembered Allah by. But even when he entered the washroom, he said a supplication, he remembered Allah even before he entered the washroom. Right, when he entered the masjid, when he entered the house, when he exited the house, when he entered the marketplace, he was always in the state of remembrance of Allah. And that this is one of the highest goals of this religion, is that it brings us into the state of remembrance of Allah, such that our hearts are always attached to the divine, even in we're in, we're always attached to the sacred, even if apparently we're in mundane states or doing mundane things, but our heart is attached to the sacred and to the divine. And that this religion, by these concepts of taqwa, is that it completely eradicates that idea that your religious life is here and then your worldly life is there and it's two separate things. Because taqwa is not limited right, to, to praying and fasting, rather it goes back to one's interactions with one another and specifically one aspect of taqwa that is really important that really eradicates this idea, this false dichotomy, this divorcement of these two ideas is the concept of amana, which is roughly translates as a trust. In other words, if you deposit someone with something, is that they have the obligation, they have the responsibility to look look after that thing, and that when you come back, that they pay back to you, and that's a trust. You deposit something, and they pay back to you, and that's a trust. That's at a basic level, right? Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَن تُؤَدُّ الْأَمَانَاتِ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهَا وَإِذَا حَكَمْتُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ أَنْ تَحْكُمُمْ بِالْعَدْلِ So Allah says, God says, is that Allah commands you to repay trust to their people and that when you judge among people, that you judge with justice. Right? And the Prophet says, so, أَدِّلْ أَمَانَةَ إِلَىٰ مَنِئْتَ مَنَكْ وَلَا تَخُنْ مَنْ خَانَكْ Is that pay your trusts to the one who has entrusted you 
and don't cheat people even if they have cheated you. Right? So at a basic level, that's a trust. However, again, going back to this the strongest idea in history, the unification of Allah, the oneness of Allah, the Tawheed, is that this amount of this understanding of trust applies to every aspect of our lives. Why? Because Allah has entrusted us, He has created us, and He has given us everything that we have. So in other words, everything that Allah has given us, He has entrusted that to us, and we have the responsibility to look after that, and to protect that, and to preserve that. And that's why, right, uh, trust relates to every aspect. So it relates to our hearing, our bodies, our limbs, our faculties, our eyes, our, our, our ears, everything. And that's what Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَقِفْ مَا لَيْسَ وَلَا تَقْفُ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ in the sam'a wal basara wal fu'ada kullu ulaika kana kullu ulaika kana anhu mas'ula as allah says verily your hearing and your sight and your hearts your emotions your cognitive faculties all of that you are responsible for right it's mas'ula mas'uli is a responsibility which is the same word in english is that you have to provide a response for it is that you're entrusted with something and you have to provide a, you have to provide a trust for that thing and so al amana tashmilu kullu ma yahmil insan min amri dinihi wa dunyahu qawlan wa fa'lan so this trust or this personal integrity it is encompasses everything that the individual individual faces from religious or worldly matters from speech or actions wal amana tu hi ada huquq and that trust is that you fulfill people's rights you fulfill rights wal muhafaza alayha that you preserve those rights فَالْمُسْلَمْ يُعْتِي كُلَّ ذِي حَقِّ حَقِّ is that the true believer gives everyone who has a right he gives them his due وَيُؤَدِّي حَقُّ اللَّهِ فِي الْعِبَادَةِ and that this is what the modern world has forgotten is that Allah has حقوق Allah has rights so before we speak about human rights Allah has rights God has rights and from his rights is that he's worshipped so he fulfills the right of God by worshipping him and acknowledging him وَيَحْفِذُ جَوَالِرُحُ عَلَى الْحَرَامِ and that he fulfills the rights of his limbs by abstaining from those things that are not in his interest, that are prohibited. And that he, 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 uh, he fulfills the rights with regards to other people. So again, it relates to religious obligations. And that's why they mentioned that Sayyidina Ali, when the time for prayer used to come in, when it was time to pray, his face, his color of his, his, his face would actually change. The color of his, his, his skin would actually change. He'd become pale. He was so fearful. And then when they asked him, Sayyidina Ali, why is it that when the prayer time enters, we see this change upon you? And he says that this is the right, this is the trust, this is the amana that Allah has placed on humanity, is that they stand before their Lord and they pray. So he saw that he regarded the salah, the prayer itself, as an amana. Right, and that's why in the prophetic hadith, right, Allah, uh, the Prophet said in a prophetic report, "Man hafidha, whoever preserves the salah, the prayer, wahafidha alayha hafidha dina." Oh, sorry, this is a statement of uh, Ibn of Umar. Is that he says, "Whoever preserve, preserves the prayer, who guards it, is that he has preserved his religion, and whoever neglects it, is that he has neglected his other religious obligations." <coughs> and then again, the trust, this amana. It relates to our bodies, our limbs, our faculties, our hearts, right? Uh, and then in a prophetic hadith, the Prophet said about the treachery of one's eye. How does an eye? How does an eye fulfill its? How is an eye treacherous? Is that called al ain tazni? Is that the eye, in a sense, in a metaphorical sense, can fornicate, right? When we're looking at things that we're not supposed to, it's prohibited that we're not supposed to look at, and the qalb yazni, and that the heart as well, it can fornicate when there's thoughts in the mind and thoughts in the heart. So the fornication of the eye is the illicit glance. And the fornication of the heart is those thoughts that play, that those thoughts in a person's mind. And then there's the trust, or this amana, or this personal integrity, this amana that rela relates to speech. So speaking truthful is not just an ethic or a virtue, but it's actually a trust that every single individual has. And not only that, is that the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, and this is very beautiful, this is very important, and it's regards to keeping people secret and confidentiality, is that the Prophet said, if someone speaks to you, 
And that that person, you can see that when he's speaking to you, he doesn't want anybody to hear. He's looking back and forth to see if anybody else is hearing. In other words, it's confidential. amana, And that that speech is, a, is a, even if he didn't say, keep this a secret, is that that's a secret between you and him. And that telling that and break, reaching the confidentiality is khiyana, it's, it's treachery in that sense. And then very important is that this concept of amana, this concept of trust and personal integrity, it relates to our daily lives and to our work and to our occupations. And that the Prophet said in a very scary hadith, in a very scary prophetic report, he said that thalathatu ana khasmuhum yawm al qiyamah. Is that three people, three categories of people, I will be their advocate on the day of judgment. I will advocate for them on the day of judgment. Man kuntu khasmuhu khasamtuhu yawm al qiyamah. Rajulun a'atabihi thumma ghadar is that a man who was given something and then he was treacherous in that trust is that the Prophet ﷺ will advocate on his behalf and that a man who sold a free man in slavery so these are major sins is that another and the Prophet will advocate for a man who, re who hired somebody to do some work and that man did the job well however the hiring company he didn't pay that person and he failed to pay that person, and he failed to recompense that person for his labor. And that the Prophet ﷺ said, or one time the Prophet ﷺ was walking in the market, and he saw someone was selling dates. So he looked and he examined those dates, and he found that after he picked up the dates on the top, is that the dates on the bottom were wet. Right? And that's obviously cheating because he's presenting his good dates and he's hiding the fact that he has inferior quality dates on the bottom of his uh, of his pile. And that the Prophet said, when he saw this, what this happened was first it was treacherous. The Prophet said, he said, Laysa minna man is that he's not from us, the one who cheats us. Right? Laysa minna man is that the one who cheats us is not from us. And that there's another mention there's another story that they mentioned that Imam Abu Hanifa, who was a great scholar but also a merchant, is that he was selling, he used to sell clothes and silk and things like that. And one day he had one particular item, a particular article, that had a defect in it. And he didn't want to sell it because it had that defect. So one day his companion who was with him, he took that article and he sold it. And Imam Abu Hanifa came back and he said, where is it? And he said, I sold it. And they said, did you, find, did you tell, did you clarify to the person that you sold it to that there was a defect in it? There was some flaw in it? And he says, no, I didn't clarify. <laughs> so Imam Abu Hanifa says that you have proved treacherous, and he took whatever money that he received from that man, and he gave it in charity. Right? He didn't want to breach the trust. And then again, this trust also relates to marital relationships. Is that the Prophet said, Inna min al-amana From the greatest of trusts with Allah on the Day of Judgment, Rajulun yufdi ila imrati. <laughs> Is that a man and a woman spend they spend intimate time together, and then the person goes on and to tell, describe and say things of personal details that he shouldn't be saying. That that's from the worst of sins that the Prophet said. So that's breaching of the trust. So what I'm trying to emphasize is that this quality of taqwa, these qualities of amana and trustworth and integrity, is that they're not just religious obligations. Is that they pertain to every single aspect of our lives what we say, what we look at, even what we eat, right? Our children, our spouses, our families, is that all the religion covers all of that in a comprehensive way and it's meant to guide us back to Allah, guide us back to God and that in a famous beautiful hadith the Prophet summarizes it and he says, كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ فَمَسْؤُولٌ أَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ is that the Prophet says, all of you are ra'in, are literally shepherds and you're, and, and, and you're responsible for your herd, right? As metaphorically speaking, all of you have responsibilities and that you will be questioned concerning your responsibilities. So then the Prophet clarified, is that that person who is in a position of authority is that he will be questioned with regards to the people under his authority. And that a man is responsible for his family and that he will be asked concerning them. And 
and that a woman, a spouse, a lady, she's responsible for the house of her husband and for her children, and that she will be asked concerning that. Isn't it the case that everyone has this responsibility in some form or another, and that everyone will be asked and questioned about that responsibility? May Allah give us tawfiq in fulfilling our trusts. May Allah make us amongst the people of taqwa and amongst the people of amana. May Allah accept from us all. Allah Azza wa Jal yaqul, wa bi qawli yahdil al-muhdadin jalla fi ula. وإذا قرئ القرآن فاستمعوا له وأنسوا لعلكم ترحمون وقال عز من قائل القرآن فإذا قرأت القرآن فاستعذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خصر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر نقول قول هذا واستغفر الله العظيم لك ولي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين كل ذنب فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وسلم تسليما. This responsibility or this concept of trust of personal integrity it, it isn't a neutral matter. It isn't something that we can just kind of, it's not something that's limited to a certain group of people or scholarly people or people who studied or anything like that, is that it applies as we just saw, as you've just seen in the previous hadith, prophetic report, that it applies to every single individual. And just like, and the companions, the companions of the Prophet وسلم, is that one of the things that they feared most was these trusts. Because they realized the severity of not fulfilling and not giving these trusts their due. And why did they realize or how did they realize that severity is that the Prophet ﷺ spoke very severe about people who don't honor their trusts. And in one of these hadith, one of these prophetic reports where the Prophet said that the sign of a hypocrite is three. There's three signs of a hypocrite. إِذَا حَدَّثَ كَذَبَ Is that when he speaks, he lies. وَإِذَا وَعْدَ أَخْلَفَ And that when he promises, he doesn't fulfill his promise. وَإِذَا إِئْتَمِنَ خَانَ And that when he's entrusted with something, is that he's treacherous. Right? And in another prophetic hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that there is no faith لا إيمانا لمن لا أمانة له is that whoever doesn't have this quality, this attribute of being trustworthy, is that he has no faith. And it's interesting that the word Iman and Amana is that they're related to each other, etymology speaking. Is that Iman is faith, and Amana is that trust. And that in sense, there's different ways that they're correlated, but in a sense that our belief in Allah is based on this trust. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ said, أَوَّلُ مَا يَرْفَعُ مِنَ النَّاسِ الْأَمَانَةِ Is that the first thing, the first quality that will be taken away from people is this quality of trustworthiness. وَآخَرَ مَا يَبْقَى مِنْ دِينِهِمْ الصَّلَاةِ And the last thing that will remain from their deen. So they won't have all the other qualities of this religion except the last thing that will remain with them is the prayer, the outward form of the prayer. وَرُبَّ مُسَلِّي لَا خَلَاقَ لَهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى There might be a person that prays and he fasts, but he has no value with Allah. Why? Because he doesn't have these essential qualities. And from these essential qualities is the trust, is having that personal integrity. Right? And one time a man came to the Prophet and he asked him, when is the last hour? When is the day of judgment? Right? And the Prophet said, Is that when trusts are neglected, when people don't have this quality of trustworthiness, then you can wait for the Day of Judgment. In other words, it's close. And then he said, but then on the other side, is that just how there's, with every responsibility, is that there's great virtues that come along with it, just as neglecting it, is that there's great peril in that, 
is that the Prophet said, Arba'un, Arba'un, Fala alayka ma fataka min dunya. Is that if you have four qualities, if you have these four qualities, then you don't worry, you don't need to worry about the things that you missed from this world. Right? What are these four qualities? Siddiqul hadith, is that you speak truthfully. Whenever you speak, you're speaking truthfully. Wahidlul amana, and that you respect and you guard and you give due to your trusts. Wahusnul khalq, khulq. And that you have good good character, or ifbatul mut'im, and that you and that you give food to the needy. And then in another prophetic hadith about trusts, is that the Prophet said said in kuntum tuhibbuna and yuhibbukum Allah Rasulu, is that if you want that Allah that God loves you and that the Prophet loves you, the hafidu ala thalathi khisal, then make sure guard these three qualities, these three attributes. Again, sidqul hadith, truthful speech. وَأَدَاءَ الْأَمَانَةِ And fulfilling your obligations, by fulfilling your trusts and your obligations. وَحُسْنُ الْجِوَارِ And that being a good neighbor to your neighbors. And that this applies to your local neighbors next to you. It also applies to the Muslim community. That the neighbors that we have in these lands, that we have to show good qualities. We have to show good, 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 good uh, character towards everybody. And then another beautiful hadith, the Prophet said, قَالَ إِذْمِنُوا لِي سِتَّنْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَضْمِنْ لَكُمَ الْجَنَّةِ Is that guarantee six things from yourselves and I will guarantee for you paradise. What are these six, six, six aspects? أُسْتُقُوا إِذَا حَدَّثْتُمْ Is that speak when you speak, speak truthfully. وَأُوفُوا إِذَا وَعَدْتُمْ And that if you make a promise, fulfill your promise. وَأَدُّوا الْأَمَانَةِ And that fulfill your trusts. إذا اتمتم إذا انتشرتم وحفظوا فروجهم فروجكم and that preserve your chastity right وبدوا أبصاركم and lower your gaze وكفوا أيديكم and don't harm anybody so may Allah give us the tawfiq to realize the seriousness of these trusts and in reality is that this religion is a trust in our hands and we have to fulfill that trust Allah has entrusted us with this beautiful religion and if we don't learn it, and if we don't implement it, and if we don't value it, then in reality, we're not fulfilling that trust. And that this is the essence of this religion and these teachings. So may Allah give us success in fulfilling this, and may Allah accept from us, and may Allah forgive us. وَأَعْلَمُوا يَا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ أَنَّ اللَّهِ أَمْرَ بِأَمْرٍ بَدَى فِي بِنَفْسِهِ فَقَالْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَةُ يُسَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ عَمْنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تسليما. اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد عبد رسولك النبي الأمي وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم وبارك على سيدنا محمد عبد رسولك النبي الأمي وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم عز الإسلام ونصر المسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام ونصر المسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام ونصر المسلمين اللهم كن إخواننا المسلمين في مشارق الأرض وغاربها اللهم اغفر لنا وللمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات مغفرة ظاهرة وباطنة سرا وعلانية لا تغادر لنا ذنبا ولا نكتسب بعدها خطيئة ولا إثما إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروه على نعمه يزدكم ولذكر الله أكبر وأقيم الصلاة